hit it. It's October 23rd, 2020, episode 102. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we're pleased to welcome to the show veteran FX prop trader David Creasa. We have a terrific discussion about his time in the early 1990s when foreign exchange trading was truly the wild west of financial markets. David then tells us the story of when the Swiss National Bank let the Euro Swiss floor drop out, and finally he shares with us some of terrific wisdom for all young traders out there. Then all the technicians will be pleased to hear Patrick is back for talking charts. No more listening to my nonsense. All right. And this week in trading history, we go back to the mini crash of 1989. And Taylor jumps on to share this week's WTF clip end with our new segment of No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We've got a great show coming up. Lena, hop on. What beer are we drinking this week? Today, we're drinking Rorschach Brewing Company's Serenity Hoppy Lager. Sounds good. Yeah, brewed with oats and wheat and hopped exclusively with galaxy. Notes of citrus, light tropical fruit, and fresh baked bread with a floral character and light spice. Refreshing and crisp with a subtle hop character and light bitterness. Uh, you know, I, I like I'm it. I'm kind of worried. I, I hear something about baked bread. And it just <laughs> it worries me, but I actually like this. Yeah, it's actually a good beer. It it's is. like George Costanza's dad. And you know, it's like a lot. Serenity now. It's Serenity now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you should say while you're drinking this beer. Surrender right. me now. <laughs> okay. Let's get on to our first guest. What about the disclaimer? That's right. Oh. Here we go. I'll Here we... do the disclaimer now, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include the dirty Goldman sack. Can't you trust googly eye? <laughs> Debate drowsiness. <laughs> Do you know, uh, we have to be, I have to tell people, Taylor writes these for us and he's way smarter than me. I like that one. That could be my best one, his yeah. best one ever. Dirty I Goldman agree. Sack. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's get on with the show. It's our pleasure to welcome to the show, David Krisa. Uh, I've had the good fortune to get to know David and chat about the markets, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time because I find that many of my views are echoed in this uh, veteran of Wall Street, Chicago, Greenwich, all over the place. I'm looking forward to learning about his career, learning about what he thinks about the markets. David, it's a pleasure having you on today. Well, thanks a lot, Kevin. Yeah, I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the invite and Patrick and Lena. It's nice, uh, nice getting to know you. Um, Thank you. I was say, I was saying yesterday it'll be nice. You know, I'm in I'm based in Chicago, and it'll be nice when the uh, when the wall between Canada and the U.S. <laughs> falls again, so I can bring my 13 year old up and play some ice hockey in Toronto, and you know we can get out to dinner and have a beer. And well, uh, we are looking stuff. forward to that, and I do know that there's a, quite a rivalry between the Canadian and the the Canadian and the Northern states. It seems yes. to be one of the things you guys come to all of our tournaments. We go down to yours. Uh, it, is a, it is a kind of a, a time-honored tradition amongst Canadians and, uh, and the Americans when it comes to hockey. Absolutely. Well, we, you know, we're looking for better competition. So, we, you know, we're, hap <laughs> we're happy to go north. And I know, you know, the kids are missing it because we're basically playing the same teams over and over again right now. But you guys are uh, catching up in terms of the hockey. For a while there, it was uh, you guys, uh, we really were uh, head and tails above you guys. But it seems like every single year you guys get better and better and better. And it's only a matter of time till I think you're beating us on a regular basis. I know that's sacrilege for a Canadian to say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we're getting there. They're working hard at it. That's for sure. But yeah, we do. We do miss. We do miss Toronto. We're so, usually up there four or five times a year. So let's get to know you in terms of your career, and uh, let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? What school did you go to? And how did you get into this business? Yeah. So I uh, I grew up in a uh, a little town called Kohler, Wisconsin, which is famous for plumbing products. I'm sure you've all seen the K on the urinal or the toilet or the shower or the sink. Um, tiny, tiny little village, 2,000 people. Um, I knew that wasn't for me. Um, I was looking to go to, you know, to a bigger city. So I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, you know, Big Ten school. It's the big, big state school in Wisconsin. Back then, it was very easy to get into. Um, now, my daughter is a, who's a sophomore there much, uh, much more difficult, but it, uh, 
yeah, it was a, it was an eye opener because you know, I think I had 40,000 kids in, at the University of Wisconsin at the time. So it was a big change from my 35 person high school graduating <laughs> class. Um, but, you know, great spot and, you know, delighted that my daughter's up there and my wife went to school there and her parents went there. So we've got a, you know, a long history of uh, Wisconsin Badgers in our family, which is great. Um, so, yeah, from Wisconsin, I graduated in 1992 and we were in a bit of a recession. So there weren't too many jobs in the States at the time. And I um, managed to get a job on the, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, my first job was with Dean Witter. I was making uh, $4.25 an hour uh, running paper. So pre-electronic, um, you know, a phone clerk would take an order. He'd hand me a slip of paper. I'd go to the lumber pit and lumber was either limit up or limit down. And it was run by the <laughs> Chicago, it was, it was run by the Chicago mafia. Um, that was an interesting place. Those guys are probably still there or their, you know, or their kids are there. Or their grandkids are there at this point. Um, and, but it was funny because when Kevin and I were talking, I realized that my first day on the trading floor was September 16th, 1992. And you have a slide for that and you can show what happened um, on that day, on this day in history. So this nice. is when George Soros broke the Bank of England. British pound dropped four or 5% in the day. Um, I had absolutely no idea what was going on other than I was running a lot of paper to the British pound pit um, at the time. And, uh, you know, little did I know how big of an event this was and how this would go down as, you know, Searles will go down as one of the greatest currency speculators of all time. And this, uh, you know, at the time was the greatest trade of all time. And, um, you, you know, were there for weeks. history in the making. You yeah, stepped onto the it, floor on the the day history was made, and you it was it was lost. It, it was you didn't you weren't able to appreciate it. Yeah, I, I really had no idea what was going on. It, it was probably a week later when you know the more I read about what had just happened, and, and I thought to myself, uh, you know, when I grow up, I, I think I want to be a currency trader. So, <laughs> um, so I was down on the floor for a bit, and I know Kevin spent some time down there. Really, really wasn't really wasn't for me. Um, I, I moved from, from Dean Witter to a, another firm. Uh, one of the filling brokers um, looked at me and said, Hey, I need a, I need a guy in the pit and I'm six foot four. You know, you, size does matter in the trading pit. And yeah. uh, so I was in the trading pit for a little while, but I, I just, I could sense that this wasn't really what I wanted to do. And uh, I was able to get transferred upstairs um, out east uh, to the to the trading desk, and I was a, a junior currency trader. Um, right. So we were doing a lot of the cash futures arm at the time, which right. was you know all over voice. So you, I would be on the headset, I'd be talking to my uh, phone broker down on the floor. He'd be hand signaling in the trades to the to the to the, the guy in the pit, and we would just do the arbitrage. And you know back then early nineties, there was still some arbitrage. Um, you know, it was much better in the late eighties. Um, but there was still some arbitrage and this firm that I worked for was triple A rated, you know, huge balance sheet. We could take on a ton of forward risk and, you know, so we'd, we'd make little bits on the arbitrage and then we would just manage our forward book. And it was very, very profitable business. We had, you know, we had two traders in every currency pit. This was only currencies. Wow. Um, so we were one of the, one of the larger um, firms out there. You know, we competed with, uh, I would say Morgan Stanley at the time was was probably right up there with us. But um, it was a very profitable business. It was a great place to learn how to trade. I was surrounded by, you know, really famous metals traders and, and currency traders and, you know, market makers and prop traders. And it was a great place. And I spent a few years there. But, you know, the culture wasn't really for me. Um, I, uh, and at that point, people were just going to the next job to get a pay rise, right? So um, 
I did that. I went went to another bank for a few years and I was a chief dealer there on the spot desk and was all, you know, market making, some prop trading. Um, I then moved on to, I, I found an interesting job um, trading prop and market making. Again, this is all FX. Um, and it was a, uh, it's a European bank and I was working in New York and we had a private bank banking division. And uh, I remember the, one of the first weeks I was there, one of the private bank guys who was all suited and booted and came out of his plush office, you know, in the back. And he came to the trading desk and he tapped me on the shoulder and he whispered in my ear. He said, David, sell $300 million yen. So $300 million yen is a big number. It's a right. big ticket. Um, it can move markets. We, so I go about my business. I start selling dollar yen and it's heavy and it's, selling it a little bit lower and a little bit lower. And we got guys on the trading desk at the time that were selling some for their own account. Next thing you know, we're probably short $600 million yen. And a few minutes later, the institutional sales guy who covered the hedge fund clients stood up. He said, David, sell a billion dollar yen. So I'm like, okay. We go out, and at this point, the market is really dropping. Um, you know, volatility was higher in FX back then, and you know things could move a couple percent um, without you know, no problem. And now we're putting a lot of pressure on this market. We get done selling the billion. Private banker comes back out a few minutes later, taps me on the shoulder. He says, "David, buy that three hundred million dollar yen back, please." I do that. Two percent lower. That's call it $6 million profit for the private banking client. Now, keep in mind, currencies, over-the-counter currencies, it was the wild, wild west in the 90s. Right. Really up until the financial crisis. The CFTC was a governing body for the futures, obviously. Yeah. But for over-the-counter currencies, you could do anything you want. There was no such thing as <laughs> front-running. There was... It was truly the Wild West. And and um, I, I saw, I mean, I, I was telling Kevin, I'm like, I should get together with some of my old colleagues and we should brainstorm and just write a book on what <laughs> some of the things that we saw, um, you know, back in the 90s, because the wow. stories are endless. So why don't you explain and, to people what had happened there? Who was the first order from? And, and you know, they put $6 million in their jeans, but how did, how did they know what was coming? So... Essentially, the private client that sold the $300 million also happened to be a partner at a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. Right. So he essentially did what it was legal to do, but he figured he'd sell some for his personal account and then have the hedge fund come in and sell some more. And you're pretty much guaranteed it's going to be lower and not higher. Right when those it, types of flows it, come through the market. It's, it's, so it's kind of shocking, isn't it? Like to think back and to, and to contrast the two times nowadays, you know, the, the compliance is through the roof and if anything, everyone's complaining about the compliance. And back then it was like almost anything went like it was crazy. Like that's like, that's a crazy story. Basically he's front running his own hedge fund. Right. Yeah. And it was go. It went on for a long, long time. And, you know, like I said, the, uh, really until the financial crisis, um, it was a unregulated business. Do you know, you know, um, in, here in Canada, we had hedge funds set up their own brokerage firms. And so they owned brokerage firms. And then what they would do is they would put all the commission dollars through the brokerage firm. So they would, right. so they would just write themselves tickets that way. So this, this has been going on in, in many different forms, you know, of hedge funds kind of almost stealing from their, from their unit holders almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's been, it was going on for a really, really long time. And, you know, so it, and it, you, you talk about compliance and you talk about, you know, red tape and that was, that's kind of a good segue. Um, so after spending kind of the first half of my career on the sell side, uh, an old colleague of mine, um, from one of the, one of the banks that we worked at, we sat down over a beer and discussed starting up, a. um, a currency proprietary trading group. So we spoke to some of the Chicago 
hedge funds and some of the Chicago prop shops. And, um, you know, no one was really in over-the-counter currencies at this point. Um, you know, the hedge funds were, were trading it, but we wanted to focus specifically on over-the-counter currencies and over-the-counter currency options. And we were going to build a group from scratch. Um, you know, we knew a lot of people in the FX market. You know, it was a very, uh, you know, very tight-knit kind of group of group of people. And we had all kind of worked at multiple shops. So you knew a lot of people in this business. Um, so we started building, we, we found a backer. So we basically needed a, we needed a prime broker and we had great technology. We had great contacts with all the investment banks. So we were covered by everyone. So we had great research. We had great technology. We had all the liquidity in the world. Um, and we were kind of on the forefront of, um, you know, of foreign exchange in a, under a prop umbrella because um, no one else was doing it at the time. I mean, there were the, you know, there were the, the odd foreign exchange only hedge funds. Uh, you know, there were the macro hedge funds that traded foreign exchange, but no one was really trading it full time the way we were. And, and, and we got in there early. It was, you know, kind of 2004 or five when we started it. And, you know, the process was hire some senior guys, ex-bank guys, bring them, bring them in under the umbrella, but then hire good people, hire kids out of college, you know, go through that whole process. And, and, you know, one of the things that we, we found worked was, you know, we were hiring a lot of athletes, um, but it was a numbers game. It was, you hire 10 kids, maybe three of them worked out after six months get rid of seven, you'd hire another 10. And, but over, you know, a few years, all of a sudden you had kind of a 30 to 40 person prop shop, right. specifically trading FX, um, which was very unique at the time. Um, so, you know, it was a, it was really that those early days, it was just really fun to build something and to, you know, kind of my entrepreneurial spirit came out and, um, you know, and we had, a, we had a, pretty long rope and we had a, a great backer with, you know, very sticky money. And, you know, we struggled the first couple of years. Volatility in FX was very, very low. And then we got lucky, you know, our timing was great. We had a, a, a decent team intact by the time 2007 came around. And then you started seeing, you know, upticks in volatility and, you know, that for us was great. Like that, that kind of 07, 09 was just a great period um, for trading FX, you know, cause we're essentially a long volatility group, right? You know, we thrive when the shit's hitting the fan. Yeah. Um, so and, this was at know, the we're... forefront of kind of electronic trading, like the transition from the old days of phoning up brokers and all of a sudden the dealers were putting stuff on the screen and allowing you to trade off of their quotes, right? Like, was there a yeah. lot of, uh, arbitrages and other things that were, or just, you know, as the, as the dealers were learning and, and doing, getting, going through that and their growing pains, was there money to be made kind of as their systems weren't really as sophisticated as they should have been? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like very early days there, uh, a lot of the banks would just give you a single bank trading platform. Right. So you might have city banks, you might have JP Morgan, you might have UBSs, and you could just put them up side by side. And there was definitely latency, like for okay. the really quick video game addict type <laughs> yeah. kid, you know, there was def there was arbitrage and you okay. could, you could do that. That didn't last too long. You know, some people automated it and then you'd get in trouble with the counterparty. And we were, we weren't in that business. We were in the business to, you know, for us, our edge was our relationships that we had and the liquidity that provided and the, you know, the, the tightness of the spreads. And we were, cause we were all point and click trading. We right. weren't, we didn't have any automated programs trying to arbitrage the, you know, one machine to the next. And, you know, we were purely discretionary directional point and click traders and our ticket sizes weren't huge. So we weren't disrupting the price. Right. And unless so the headline, you were just trying headline came out. So you were trying to just surf little waves in essence in this huge group of a whole bunch of traders doing this in terms of like yeah. trying, trying to catch, you know, 20 ticks out of something or like that. Yeah, kind of... it was definitely shorter term. Yeah, it was definitely shorter term. Um, you know, we had access to the options market so you could put on, 
you know, if you had a one month view or, you know, you put on some options and stuff, but you know, a lot of it was just very plain Jane over the counter spot FX, um, you know, trying to take advantage of like the, you know, the intraday intraday moves. Um, so one of the things you've mentioned is that you were, you, you hired a lot of athletes and after someone who sat there and actually you must have hired hundreds of different people throughout the years in your prop group or, or at least a hundred. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Way north of a hundred. Yes. Okay. What were some of the things that in terms of what you looked for and, and did that change over time? And what were some of the, the surprising kind of, uh, insights that you got in terms of the different characteristics in terms of hiring people that were and weren't successful. Yeah. And you know, that's, it's interesting because we, we did hire a lot of athletes. Um, you know, one of the things that I noticed early on and we had, we had some superstars, like, I, I mean, I would, you know, some of these kids and after a few years they were up to speed or even, you know, some of them were up to speed within a year and you'd look at their work ethic was unbelievable. They were the first people in, the last people out. They never left the screen. And they were just learning. They were trying to get their 10,000 hours and they were trying to do it quickly. And, you know, when you're 23, 22, 23 years old and you have no life aside from work, it's very easy to do. You can get, you can sit in front of a screen for 16 hours a day and you can learn and you can, you know, absorb what's going on and listen to what's going on around you. And so we had a good mix of kind of senior people like myself and then these kids that were just hungry and they just wanted to learn. Um, you know, they were, they were all very competitive. They, like I said, their work ethic was off the charts. They all hated to lose, but they, their highs were never too high and their lows were never too low. Uh. Um, and that, that's something that you find in, you know, successful athletes and traders and, um, I mean, the business model at first, I did not believe in it. I didn't believe in the higher 10, fire seven, higher 10, fire seven. But after a couple of years, it just worked. Um, you know, I would have been the first person saying, this is ridiculous. You know, this is a, you know, this is like a bucket shop type mentality. But if you have the patience to run that model, you will eventually will find, you know, yourself surrounded by a, like a really interesting group of people. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, hey, listen, we didn't, not every person we hired was an athlete, but there were plenty of hockey players and basketball players and football players. I mean, these guys, they were the ones that would, you know, they'd be in the gym before work and they'd still be on the desk at 6am. Um, and that, you know, it takes a certain individual, uh, you know, with that drive to really, you know, to really be successful in this business. So, David, you must have seen a lot of different uh, market periods during this time and watched a lot of different traders handle different situations in good and bad ways. One of the big kind of events on the foreign exchange side of uh, markets that, although you mentioned the, the pound, there was one that was more recently that a lot of stock traders and other traders aren't as aware of, but was actually kind of almost your 1987 crash on the foreign exchange market, which was when the Swiss National Bank depegged against the euro. Why don't you tell us like where you were at the time and how you guys handled it and what you saw? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was clearly the biggest event in my um, career. And, you know, I was at the, at the prop shop at the time. And, um, you know, we do, we do have a slide that you can you know, show our listeners the, uh, what the, what, what the slide looks like. But, um, if you, if you go back to 2011, which was in the, you know, the depths of the, uh, European, um, crisis, debt crisis. And, you know, there was quite a, you know, a lot of volatility and the Swiss strength, Swiss franc was strengthening. Um, you know, the, the market was looking for a safe haven, desperately looking for a safe haven. And, um, you can see, um, you can see what happened. So in, in 2011, it, the, the Euro Swiss went, got down to uh parity, 
Right. You're from, the Swiss franc got down to parity. From 120 earlier, kind of before right. that period. Right, right. So, you know, it was a significant drop, and it's understandable. I mean, we all know what was going on and with, the, and, you know, with, with Europe at the, at the time. So they were looking for a safe haven. So, you know, when the euro Swiss goes down, that means the euro is weakening, the Swiss franc is strengthening. Um, and so they defended, they defended parity. It popped back up. And then you can, you can see on the chart that from 2012 to 2014, they were completely fed up with the S and B was completely fed up with the Swiss franc. So they put a floor under the Euro Swiss right at 120. Uh, so what happens? Well, look at that. That's 2012, 13, 14, three years of basically no price movement at all. Right. So at this point, they're, they're buying euros and selling francs. To keep they are it buying there. euros and selling francs. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, so that was a, you know, that was a market that we just didn't trade. Right. You know, it was, you know, it was currency traders. No one really paid attention to it. And, um, you know, we didn't trade any Swiss products because there's no point. Uh, there was no volatility at all. And then all of a sudden, January, uh, in January of 2015, now leading up to this, to them throwing in the towel and pulling the floor, there was a lot of pressure and there was just constant selling. We All we heard about is all the selling. Um, there were hedge funds that were trying to buy puts on Euro Swiss, right? So they would profit if, if Euro Swiss went down. A lot of the banks were smart enough, a couple of Canadian banks in particular, were smart enough not to allow any strikes below the 120 barrier. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, I, I had a friend at Bank of Montreal and they, they didn't allow any stop losses and, you know, for spot and they didn't allow any, um, any structures below 120. Now, some of the more aggressive banks did. And when the peg or not the peg, but when, when the floor dropped, it was, I mean, there were hundreds of millions of dollars of losses for some of these banks. Um, right. Cause so it went from 120 know, down to 88 or something like that. And yeah. I think 85, was, 50 was the low or, right. or something. And it was 29% move basically in an hour or not even yeah. an hour in, in half yeah. an hour. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was very quick. And then it was up and down. Now I was asleep when this happened. <laughs> I was based in Chicago. I was asleep, but I got a call from one of my guys in London right as it was happening. So I was up, I was in front of the screens. Um, you know, there was still a lot of chaos in like that first couple hours um, of trading. And, you know, I never saw the low, uh, but there was, it was plenty of chaos, uh, you know, within that kind of hour of trading. But what happened was, the back office, we, we, we did hundreds and hundreds of trades, right? Cause I had a European team. So there were call it 20 traders that were involved in, in trading this as the, as the floor went out. And then it got down to trying to reconcile the trades right. and the timestamps and the price because the market was 5% wide. You know, it's usually, five basis points wide. Right. So there was so much chaos and there were so many trades that once things did settle down a bit, we, we spent hours trying to reconcile these trades and, you know, you'd have bank X, Y, Z complaining about us selling them one Euro Swiss at one nineteen the figure, and then buying it back at one seventeen the figure. But if you look at the timestamp and the tick chart, it was, the next print was like 110, the figure, <laughs> right? right? So I'm like, well, we, yeah, we sold to you 119. We bought it back for you 117, but a split second later it was trading 110. So you, you should thank us for the liquidity that we're providing you. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and and so um, there there must have been stories in the FX community about people just getting like zeroed and and going bankrupt, right? And hedge funds blowing up and like this was an unprecedented move in in currency land. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were there were stories of hedge funds going under. There were stories of I, I mean that you know a lot of these banks that we dealt with, like the you know our counterparties, you know the. You know, there are a couple of banks who lost three, four hundred million dollars in this. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, real, real money. But it did. T- it took a while. It, you know, we were, we were going back and forth with these banks. If we wanted, you know, obviously, you know, we, we, pr- we wanted a strong relationship with them, so we weren't, we weren't trying to steal money from them per se. We, you know, we wanted to keep a long-term relationship. So we did our part, and we adjusted fills, and you know, maybe the damage wasn't quite as bad for them as it could have been. And I think a lot of other prop shops and hedge funds did the same. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the, there were there were tons of stories of places just going completely out of, out of business. Um, so the first thing that I was thinking, so when I, I got into the office, you know, a couple hours later when things were settling down, it was still before the, the stock market opened. And I'm thinking retail, any retail FX platform is probably bankrupt, right? Because the electronic retail FX platforms, they were not nearly as sophisticated as the banks. I'm hearing stories that the banks are taking huge losses. So I actually bought puts on a uh, stock that uh, an online broker um, that focused on FX on the open that day. Yeah. It was about a fifteen dollar stock, I think, at the time, and I bought five dollar puts on it, and that stock was halted. I think the next day, and was halted for two weeks, and opened up at a dollar fifty. Nice, well wow. done, <laughs> well done. <laughs> so, although was, we shouldn't be laughing was, about somebody's uh, misfortune, but it was, you know, it was going there anyway. So you might as well profit well, from it. Yeah, I mean, and I was, you know, I was a little upset that I had missed the the 120 break in Euro Swiss because I was still sleeping. Right. Um, yeah. So I had to find a way to capitalize. And, um, you know, then there were a lot of stories like, you know, like that. And, you know, some some guys made their careers. Other, others, you know, blew up their funds. And, you know, I had one kid who was a very talented trader that I had hired in, uh, in the UK. And uh, he was at the gym and he was just packing up his bag and going back to the office that was, you know, Jim was in the basement of our building and he missed it. And he had been waiting for this for months and months. Oh, and months. He had seen and, it coming and he was waiting for it. And he just, he wasn't there when oh. the floor dropped and you either were, and you were hitting a 120 bid or you're hitting a 119 bid on its way to 85 or, or you were in the gym or you were sleeping. <laughs> right. So let's, the point oh. of the story is this kid never recovered from that. Oh, because it would have been a life-changing event for him. So this kid was 25 years old. And the way he looks at it is that he missed, you know, he left millions and millions of dollars on the table, which is true. But he never fully recovered. He was out of the business two years later. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. So it affected people in different ways. So let's talk about what had happened there. And maybe because uh, let's, you know, put on your macro hat and explain to, you know, the listeners that they see this, this big move. But why did it occur? And let's just kind of go through. As the S- S- Swiss National Bank was sitting there buying euros and selling francs, that had the effect of being inflationary on the actual Swiss economy. Is why don't you kind of walk us through what, from their perspective, they were trying to do and why they eventually threw in the towel? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, they couldn't handle the amount of pressure. There was too much, there was too much demand for the, the, the Swiss franc for, a, you know, a safe haven. I mean, you know, at that point, you know, the, the whole Eurozone project was, you know, there was a big question mark, like, is the Euro even going to work? And, you know, I think that they, they were able to stabilize things, but everyone knew eventually, you know, similar to what Soros did to the Bank of England, eventually they were going to have to pull it. That's and, right. That's right. Because at that point, know, they're buying all these euros. 
but they're creating more and more francs. And in doing so, that's pushing more and more money into the system. And I think like they, they were experiencing a housing bubble, were they not? And I think the yes. price of everything was going up. And so some of the actual citizens were complaining about it. Yeah, absolutely. And then so they tried to hold in there. And I think I remember the, the central banker, you know, denying, 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 denying. And then I guess one day he just comes out and realizes that he can't do it any longer. And so instead of letting it go down orderly, they just walk away. Well, they both they basically told the market, over, you know, for a couple of years that this floor is going to stay in place. Right. And we'll buy unlimited amounts of Euro Swiss. Which until they didn't. Right. And, you know, you know, there's also the stories where uh, there were a lot of uh, Europeans that were borrowing in their mortgages in Swiss francs. Yep. Uh, and when this move happened, they basically went under uh, like underwater on their mortgages and stuff. It's uh, crazy stories when when you hear some of the stuff that happened back then on this move. Yeah, I remember Hungary. That was a big, yeah. big play. They borrowed. They borrowed in Swiss francs. Um that, yeah. that ended in massive tears for them as well. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to present day and let's talk about some of the kind of bigger picture macro themes that you see out there. And yeah. I, I know to some extent we're sitting here in front of the election and a lot of people are on the sidelines waiting for it. And I think you've expressed to me that you're – uh, one of those people that is not taking big bets ahead of this because it's obviously introduces some volatility. But let's talk about some of your bigger term themes that you see and stuff like that. One of them is the U.S. dollar. What do you foresee kind of the most likely direction for the U.S. dollar in the coming year or two? Yeah, so we, you know, we've been we've been very bearish the dollar since call it April. Um, and we, you know, it's a little bit against consensus. And obviously, the, the big spike in the dollar during COVID, that makes sense, right? You had all this risk off. You had people flock into the safe haven of the dollar. Um, but, you know, big picture, the reason we're, especially now, even even more so, pre, like, we were bearish the dollar pre-COVID. But now, for us, we've been saying that we think this U.S. exceptionalism trade is over. Okay. And that means that all these people that own the U.S. equities, the U.S. bond market, they also own the U.S. dollar. And just take a look at our the debate last night. Take a look at the candidates that we have. <laughs> if I was a European or a Asian bondholder, I would not want to be investing here. So I wouldn't. Want, I also wouldn't want to own the dollar. And you know that's something something that we've been we've been saying for a while we just think that we think it's going to change and um you know especially now post covid or well, we're still in covid but you know post the the you know that craziness of you know february march april um every country in the world now needs a weaker dollar right the only way we're going to reflate out of this is via a weaker dollar so no one's worried about currency wars. Oh, your currency's too weak. You know, you know, we're we're not competitive, and you know, anymore. And 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 this is something that has now changed, and COVID's changed this. Right. So I think every country realizes that a weak dollar is the only way to reflate the global economy. Why do you think that the hedge fund community, or not the whole hedge fund community, but certain kind of bearish members of the hedge fund community are clinging to this uh, kind of belief that there's not enough U.S. dollars out there and that we're going to implode with a, with a massive move higher. What, what's driving that thought process and where, where are they getting it wrong? Yeah, I, I don't know where they're coming from. I mean, I've heard, I've heard of a couple of these and, you know, some of it is a, it's, it's the, the best of the worst. So you got to own the dollar. You know, I think some of these guys, are thinking that we are going to have a, you know, a big correction in equities. Um, you know, they're going to look for a safe haven play. There's no other real safe havens out there. Um, but for me, 
the most important thing, like I said, is the world needs a weaker dollar to reflate and, and you know, and actually to start growing again. Right. And this is, you know, I, I'm in the same boat. I, I've always said that uh, that the Fed and the, the U.S. government can create as many dollars as is needed. It just needs the political will. Yeah, and I and, absolutely. and I think that that's what's happened with COVID is there's been a change in the attitude amongst that. So so I agree with you in terms of the inflection a point of COVID being the new point where everyone agrees that reflating is the way to go. So in terms of other asset classes, this means that we're seeing a bond market that's all of a sudden gotten a little more boring. What do you think the implications are for the fixed income market and what might that mean for other asset classes? Well, you know, so it, one of the things, obviously, it's been working now for the past few months. Um, obviously, if you're, you know, you're playing these reflation bets and you're, the, you know, the fit between fiscal and monetary stimulus, we're trying to create inflation. So obviously, like the metals and miners are, have been great plays and they've had, you know, huge runs up. You know, it's still like silver. I think silver goes back to 50, uh, you know, gold above 3000, um, you know, as far as the DXY, we had that chart up, but the dollar index, I don't see why but a lot of people are targeting this 88 level, these old lows. I mean, I don't see why it can't go back down to 80, you know, and then, and then you're talking like the Euro dollar, the currency, you know, is kind of on the 130 handle. Um so I have no problem with that. Um, fixed income. A lot of the fixed income people I speak to are now trading more foreign exchange and more commodities because fixed income, you know, we've had a little bit of a move recently, but it's just a, it's just a wasted asset class. You know, there's all this potential for YCC. And so we, we don't spend a lot of time talking about fixed income because it's just a, it's a waste of mental energy, right, Ross? <laughs> so, do you think that that means that we're about to enter into a golden age of foreign exchange again? Like, are we are are, are we embarking on a period when we're going to get the old the volatility of old? Maybe not the volatility of old, but I do think that more pl- from from the conversations I've had, more and more people are 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 back in in foreign exchange and they're trading and they're expressing their they're expressing their macro views via FX because volatility is so low. So, you know, you can really leverage that up and you can express it via risk off, risk on, or if it's, you know, a dollar theme or it's an emerging market theme. Now, I think it's just a great vehicle. Now, Dave, when when you're talking about, uh, obviously, the U.S. dollar index, you're talking about it going potentially even down to the 80 level. But uh, are, do you favor any particular cross-currency to it? Like, do you favor, let's say, the commodity-based ones like the Aussie or, or the CAD? Or do you prefer to go to Europe? Like, which, uh, which way do you think is the best cross to express that view? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think you could express it via emerging markets. So I obviously you can't touch Turkey because dollar Turkey is uh, basically a broken market, but like dollar Mexico, for example, um, you know, that would be a good way to express kind of commodity strength, reflation, a weaker dollar. It, that kind of, that checks a lot of the boxes, Australian dollar, um, Canadian dollar. Uh, yeah. So I, the Euro British pound is too tricky right now with, all the Brexit stuff going on. I mean, you know, it's up, it's up a percent one day, it's down a percent the next day. So I think that one's kind of a mugs game. Um, the Euro, I could see the Euro continuing higher, but yeah, I think there's probably better ways to express it, um, you know, via the commodity currencies or, or the peso. Do you think that 130 on the Euro causes enough pain that the Europe starts to push back and say they don't want it put through there? Like, do you think that's the line in the sand for, Strength. I, I think it depends on the um, how quick it goes to 130. Oh, I completely. I think it's really yeah. about the pace. You know, most yeah. of these, most of these central banks, they they're not really worried about uh, strength and weakness. It's more the pace. I mean, that's the Bank of Japan has been like that my entire career, where you know they're watching the pace of yen strength or yen weakness. They're not. Um, well, they're they're mainly just concerned with yen strength, but. <laughs> They're not concerned so much of the level. It's it's the rate of change. Right. I, I you know, I speed. completely agree. 
if, if something happens overnight, it's a big difference than if it happens over a year. Right. Like, and, and that means right. everything. Speaking of the Bank of Japan, and uh, I remember back in the days when I was a young tyke on the desk, they used to come into the market and intervene to try to keep the, the, the currency you know, from strengthening too much. It's been a long time since we've actually had central banks in the market intervening. Do you think that's going to return? Yeah. I mean, they certainly haven't been in like they were in the old days where they actually kind of drew a line in the sand and you could see that they were bidding for, you know, yards and yards of dollar yen, right. you know, would show up in the machine. Oh, so they would um, show up in the machine way back when, because I, sure. I, I used to think that yeah. they would phone up and you'd get a call and they would be like, the market would be, I don't know, 104 a dime to 20. And they say, where do you offer? And you had, uh, you know, and it would be a big number, like half a billion or something. Half, and, and you would have to offer to them up higher. And then you yeah. just hope that you could get it in on time. It, like, is that, that's how it used to work, right? Way back when? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So they would generally, it would be through the Fed. So the Fed would call someone like JP Morgan and, you know, and, and buy dollar yen for the, on behalf of the Bank of Japan. Okay. So they would go to the market and then they would call, you know, three other banks and, you know, next thing you know, the dollar yen was up 2%. So were you were on a desk at that time, like making markets and you saw these things, it was, you know, because they would do in size, they would ask for us like a size market and they wouldn't be on the quote, right? Right. Well, and you knew their side. Yeah. You knew which way they're going to, as well. <laughs> you knew which way they're going. Yeah. So you'd read them up and sometimes they'd pass and other times they just needed to get them in, you know, that, that but this was because dollar yen was dropping, you know, quickly there was, you know, who knows what, what the cause was, but you know, there was a, a, a swift down move intraday and then it would get to, they didn't like the speed of the move. Maybe they didn't really like the level that it was at. So they'd come in and intervene. And then as more electronic trading started taking place, they would just leave, bids and dollar yen on the machine and so you'd see it. And then you, as soon as the last $10 were hit, then it would drop 50 pips. And so you could actually again. see it out in the machine and you knew that most likely yeah. that was them. Yeah. Well, that's crazy. I had yeah. no idea that they did that. Yeah. And now, you know, so they don't, they don't do it anymore, but the funny thing is the, the other day, dollar yen was down a bunch. Um, they dropped, I think it was like a, I was looking, I think it was about a two and a half standard deviation move on the day. Uh, that big red bar uh, was at, uh, what's that, Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a big move. I mean, just take a look back, you know, at some of these daily. And it had just been going sideways for a while. Look at what happens every time it gets down to 104. It, there, right? I mean, it's just, it bounces they're over. not, yeah. they're not showing bids on the machines. They're not verbally intervening but clearly they don't like it below 104 uh, and you can see that since august you know they've been kind of protecting that that level i get um, it you know and even when the even with the broad dollar is weakening they just don't like it below 104 so that to me you know some of my fx friends they're they've been keeping a close eye on this 104 level because if that goes you know they're calling for kind of 100 Oh, because they, because they would argue that it's being kept in there by the Bank of Japan, and if that support yeah. goes, then there's it'll be very quickly a move to one hundred. Right, or it's the GPIF, or it's you know yeah. it's some entity right. that is that is down there that doesn't doesn't like it. You know, and every time it gets to one hundred four, I get really bearish dollar yen, and then it jumps up two hundred points. And for those who know, don't so. don't know the GPIF, the GPIF is the world's largest pension plan. It's the government pension. Uh, incorporation investment. fund or some investment fund yeah. and it's yeah. it's the largest fund in the world it's uh i get they used to be the post office right like it's some yeah, strange thing exactly you know and they're just the behemoth now so did, when you, going back to the when they would intervene verbally did you ever were you ever on the other side of their trades no because no. i wasn't work they would only trade through the big u.s money center banks oh, okay because I, I kind of yeah. always thought that would be a fun job to have. Yeah. Like, where are you on two yards of this? And you have to get a price. Right. And you're either going to be really right or really wrong. And, 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 you know, they took offers that were, you know, 80 cents through, right? Like, it wasn't, right. It wasn't like, they were, you know. and Yeah. 
But then you were offside by eighty cents within a second. <laughs> That's right. So you, you were on, you 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 bought the first. So you sold them a yard, and you bought the first hundred, and you had a good cost on the first hundred. And then right. and then next thing you know, you were short on then the remaining nine hundred, and you're offside. And then they come back. Yeah. Oh yeah, they were relentless. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyways, they I, enter the market. You didn't want to be in. You didn't want to be run over by them. <laughs> you know, they, a lot of painful trades. So let's go back to gold. You mentioned that you thought three thousand. I like the fact that you're willing to call a number. I've always said that one of these days we're going to have a thousand dollar up week in gold. Uh, so I'm even uh, more bullish than you in terms of the possibility of this exploding. What where is your three thousand number? Just kind of a reasonable target or where are you coming up with that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just a reasonable target. You know, I think, uh, someone came out today, was it Goldman or someone's got a target of 2,300 in the next year. I mean, we were just up at 2,100 yeah. two weeks ago. So yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, you know, if, if, if the narrative plays out of the weaker dollar rising inflation risks, tons of fiscal and monetary stimulus there's just there's no reason why it can't continue higher right do you do you see a point where the market um actually gets almost too excited about this inflation trade like i could see a situation where let's say we got a vaccine and we've got all this stimulus in there and they 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 can't pull back on the fiscal quick enough and it is it just explodes higher and it, it ends up being kind of a trade that catches a lot of people off guard yeah that that's kind of what we're thinking um because you know we do think there'll you know we do think there will be a vaccine and, and and even if the vax even if only the people that need it the the you know the the healthcare workers and the elderly and the you know the people that have comorbidities like I don't plan on taking the vaccine the first go around. That's for sure. Right. But there's all these therapeutics. Think about think about Trump and Chris Christie. Yeah. If they had gotten COVID in April, they would be dead. Right. There's no doubt in my mind. I'm still surprised about Chris Christie. <laughs> I I called it out on yeah. It was the first thing I said. I think I texted my wife and I said, "Well, Chris Christie, he'll die from this. There's no way he's going to come back from this." Right. So if those guys can survive, clearly we're going in the right direction. And now it's just all about, it's just a big psychological, if, if you see that a vaccine has been improved, approved, it's going to allow people to feel better about opening things up. You know, and I'm, I'm talking schools mainly because I've got kids and, you know, their lives can kind of get back to normal again. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, along, along that topic, I, mean, I think this is something important to talk about. It has nothing to do with gold, but you know, one of the things I've noticed as a as a dad of three kids, I've got you know one in college and then two in high school, you know, so teenage kids. Um, I I'm worried about their mental health, and I know there's been tons written about this over the past few months, but for me, I think it's the most important thing is to get these kids back in school, get them back in sports, you know, let them hang out with their friends and let them just live their lives because this is going to be a long, long, like PTSD type event right. for these kids. No, I agree. agree. Um, there is definitely another side of the equation that is often overlooked. No doubt about right. it. It's a, I mean, and it's a delicate balancing act. And I feel bad for any politician that, that has to balance it. But, um, Taking this back to the markets, do you could you see a situation where the Fed actually gets scared about the level, of the the quickness of kind of a spike higher? And what do you see? Like they promised the market they're not going to raise rates. Do you, what would it be? What point do you think that they would actually have to go back on that, and they would get kind of worried that they almost put too much gasoline on the fire? Well, we were discussing this earlier um i was discussing with some colleagues earlier and i mean if we get if 10 years are get up to say 120 or so they're gonna panic you think they panic that quickly yeah wow 
Yeah. Why? Why do you think they're going to panic that quickly? You just think. Well, especially if if it's like if it's a quick move up, I just don't think that they're not prepared for this. And and so do you, they're do you, like that's not it's not on their radar at all that yields could actually, you know, get up to one twenty or one thirty quickly. And and do you think we they're going to easily get back to those? Are they going to panic lives? by just doing a lot more QE and doing like an operation twist, or are they going to actually do some yield curve control? Well, we think they'd start out with like an operation twist. Um, but then, you know, we would not be at all surprised if they come in with some sort of yield curve control. Isn't that the death of the bond market, though? Done. Done and dusted. Right. Like, like, are you not basically think about all of Wall Street? Like, I, I kind of I'm shocked that anybody that's in the bond market would ever want this to happen because it, in essence, is going to mean the end of, you know, government bond trading. Like go look at well, the J- that's, look at the JGBs. Yeah. Nobody trades them. Nobody trades them. I mean, this is why you know some of these people we we speak to are pivoting into some other asset classes. You know, we told them six months ago, put your commodity trading hat on. Right. Okay. Because there's no alpha in fixed income. Okay. So speaking of commodities, one of the other things that's kind of your side projects is the the commodity that us as Canadians are very fond of, which is marijuana. Um, yes. <laughs> the uh, so I know you've kind of been involved in st- in some in various companies, and one of the things is with p- a potential democratic sweep on the table. Do you think we could have a run in these com- uh, in these pot stocks going into the? Uh, uh, let's just say, you know, assuming they win in as projected, could we get a situation where we have three months, six months of a big rally in these things? Yeah, I think it would probably take if we get a if we get a blue sweep, I think it would probably take nine months before it's federally legal here. Okay. Which is then probably a time to sell it. Right. Similar to what <laughs> happened in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm pretty sure the high I think it was in the day canopy growth it was, was yeah. within yeah. a day. Yeah. Right? It was, it was um, a perfect sell the news event. Yeah. So um, you know, we're involved in multi-state operators and there happened to be Chicago is kind of a hotbed. There's a, there's a few of them that are all Chicago based out. And the one that I'm, that I'm, that we invested in is recently merged with Cureleaf. Cureleaf is one of the, I think they're now the largest multi-state operator, uh, in, you know, in the U S um, and they merge with a Chicago company. So now they have access to more States and, um, I, I think regardless um, of who wins the election, I mean, things would happen faster if it was a Democratic sweep. sweep. Um, but I still think that the momentum is going in that direction where, you know, it's on, it's on New Jersey's ballot. Um, they're going to vote in adult use this year. That'll be followed by Pennsylvania and New York and Connecticut and Rhode Island. So all of a sudden you're going to have something like 80 percent of the U.S. population will be living in states where it is adult use legal. Right. So at that point, why would you not just make it federally legal? Um, so I, I, we think the momentum is going in the right direction. And the other thing is that like the revenues are great. I mean, they're growing revenues like a hundred percent year on year. You know, the valuations are still pretty cheap. You have no real institutional U S institutional buying. We need to get this safe banking act past because that'll that'll free up because right now the only way they can raise money is private placements right like investments like myself and you know a lot of people i know have done um but you know they need debt financing they need lower costs of capital um now is that a federal law that they're not allowed to like i know yes and i know that for a long time the americans were coming up and listing in canada because it could not be listed in the states there was some weird Correct. rule about that, right? And it was kind of ironic. Yeah, I mean, they're all listed. They're all listed in Can- in, in Canada, right? Um, you know, they're. But you know, if you start seeing this momentum pick up, and I think with a with a democratic sweep, it's going to fast track U.S. institutional, ex- you know, U.S. exchange listings, which then allows U.S. institutions to buy these stocks and buy these ETFs. And, you know, there's been a, a couple year arbitrage of 
um, owning the U.S. multi-state operators and being short the Canadian listed. Oh, because you know, ours were so expensive versus yours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, look at what um, Constellation Brands did with Canopy. I mean, they paid the they paid the top. Yeah. You know, they their original investment was great, and they paid the all time highs, and I think they're still underwater on yeah. that investment. It's, it's a disaster. Well, the Canadian pot uh, sector in general was a little too much hype. You know, we got a little too excited yeah. about it. It was a lot of people lost a lot of money and. Uh, we're just scraping along the bottom and we have a lot of crappy companies out there that basically there needs to be a <laughs> lot of consolidation in this industry, you know? Uh, right. I mean, they dropped 90% from the bubble peak. Right. A lot of these, they're like you this. know, the, the U S multi-state operators, they, they dropped 80, 80%. And you know, a lot of that, I think last year was tax loss selling, um, you know, what you're not seeing this year right. because they've performed pretty well. So we don't really, we don't think that those, you know, that, that supply is going to come to market. And if anything, we're just, we're moving, you know, we're moving in the right direction. And, and as long as their revenues keep growing, I mean, they've, they've opened two dispensaries within five miles of my office. So in the Northern suburb of Chicago, you know, they're popping up everywhere. And every time I drive by, there's a line outside. Right. They, so clearly but it's David, I think, I think, I think it's a lot like what happened with the tech, uh, the internet boom, which is like in 99, everyone got excited. Then there was the 90% wipeout. The majority of them failed, huge consolidations. And then the internet went on, right? right? And I think it, I think that we just are witnessing that same cycle, but in, in the weed sector, right? Absolutely. The, yeah. the real yeah. question is, which one is the Amazon, the one that's fallen 90% <laughs> and is going to go on to be multi-multi-bagger yeah. from here? Yeah, um, and picking that my is... vote's cu- my vote is cure leaf, but you know, kind, of talk, kind of talk in my talk book. Talk in your book, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, David, let's just uh, uh, finish up here with one last thing. You've seen a lot of um, different kids that you've hired or in, that have uh, kind of gone through your prop trading group, and uh, you've been in the industry for many years and saw a lot of different markets. And if you were having to give advice to a young person today, that was very interested in the market and uh, that wanted to be a trader or a portfolio manager, what advice would you give them? Sure. Um, You know, this is something that we, you know, I've told kids countless times. Um, You know, one of the most important things is developing your own process. Um, You know, everyone's different. Everyone's made up, you know, psychologically made up different. And, you know, I think that it's really important to, to develop your own process I mean, there's so much shitty fintwit out there. There's snake oil salesmen. There's people trying to sell, you know, trading systems. There is no holy grail out there. Um, you know, I spent many years in the early part of my career, you know, trying to find that holy grail, and it, it's just not out there. Um, you know, so for me, it, I would say read a ton. Read about, you know, the history of financial markets obviously read something like reminiscence of a stock operator, you know, on a quarterly basis and just keep reading it. Um, yeah. You know, read books like this, uh, the one by De La Vaga, Confusion, Conf- yeah. Confusion de Confusion. Right. Um, I mean, this thing was written in the late 1600s, I think. It's human nature hasn't changed. Right. The same mistakes will always repeat themselves. And, you know, we had a lot of we had a lot of kids that were always kind of looking for the the right indicator. Oh, this moving average crossover, this MACD or this Stoke or this DeMarc or whatever it is. Like you have to develop your own process, whatever you're comfortable. Whatever, however, you're made up psychologically. You need to and 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 you know, like the time frame of trading, you have to develop a process that's in sync with that. David, you know what? I've heard a lot of answer. I mean, uh, answers when I've uh, asked people that question, and I, I think I'm going to give you the marks for being the best answer I've ever heard. <laughs> well, thank you. Like, like I said, I, you know, it's, I got to practice what I preach, but, um, but I've had that this similar conversation hundreds and hundreds of times, and, you know, you know, one of the other things I would say, you know, I'm, I hope that they're the, like the our college age kids are still interested in financial markets because, you know, they're going to be the next next generation. Um, but along the way, I think they probably need to get a psychology degree as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
they don't they don't necessarily need an economics and French degree like I like I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you can learn uh, it's all on job all on the job training and um, you know, I think that 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 would be a good good path. Philosophy, psychology, history. I think that's a good path for the kids. Well, that's great advice. Days. David, thank you very yeah. much for joining us this week. We really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, David. Well, thanks a lot for having me. And like I said at the, the start of the show, I can't wait for the wall to come down because uh, we're, we're all itching to get up to Toronto and love to see you guys for, for dinner sometime. Well, for sure. That'd be great. Well, and for we'll sure. hold you to that. All right. <laughs> thanks again. All right. Take care, David. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks again. You too. Thanks. All Cheers. Right. Bye-bye. Patrick, good to have you back, buddy. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> People were worried about you. Oh, you know what? Every, uh, things got complicated. I'm back in the saddle. <laughs> let's talk some charts. Well, let's talk some charts. But just for those who, who want to know... Patrick was not recovering from the Rona like some people are <laughs> worried about. Or liver transplant. Liver. No, oh, actually, that. it was the liver transplant, and I'm, <laughs> and 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 I'm back and drinking. Everything is good. It's amazing what uh, a new modern medicine does. <laughs> He's right back at it. Yeah, no, uh, Patrick had to go out of town and uh, overseas, so you're actually now quarantining. Yes, I am. I am. They All should right. make a new drink, quarantini. They do. Okay. So, Patrick, I know you you want to talk charts. Here we go. Let's do it. What do we got? All right. Well, listen, what I I figured we're going to stick with the theme. I actually uh, was uh, on the plane listening uh, to the episode where you and Cuppy and you were doing the talking charts and you came up with all sorts of chart patterns. So I figured I was going to grade your uh, new chart patterns <laughs> and actually uh, give you a score like we'd okay. score beer as to each one, whether I like them or not. Right. Okay. Good. All right. Sounds so, good. so the first one you were uh, talking about with them was the erect rhino and uh, which, uh, which Cuppy also called the uh, death by short selling. Right. And um, it's a winner. I like it. It's uh, it, it's to the point. Right. <laughs> and uh, I like it. It's definitely the good, a good, I'm going to give you, an eight out of ten. That this goes now into our our library of the patterns. Record. I like it. Yeah. No. It this it goes in there with uh, with our other ones. So now this one though, <laughs> the smelly rooster, which you use the Exxon chart. This is a fail. What? What? Like I. <laughs> I have no idea. I think you were just running out of ideas and you just like uh, came up with something. This is never going to be used again. <laughs> we're, this, we're dropping this. We're, there's not going to be no smelly rooster pattern that we're going to introduce. All right. Okay. I, I okay. can't disagree with that. Okay. It was a stretch. Even it was a stretch. It. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I did want to talk about the sneaky tortoise yeah. because uh, I do like this. Yeah, I, I do like this. The sneaky tortoise is uh, is a good pattern. It's uh, it's stocks are left for dead, uh, and or in this case yields, and and then they sneak up on you. And so I wanted to talk about two particular charts that may actually fit the bill here. Okay. Uh, uh, and so the first one here is General Electric, right? That's and from the past, nobody talks yeah, about that anymore. Exactly, sneaky tortoise, <laughs> which is it, it, it's been left for dead. It's been just bouncing along the lows. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to touch it. And uh, and look, it's uh, it's sneaking a little breakout. Is uh, is this going to be a, the uh, sneaky tortoise uh, formation and and uh, sneak up on everyone with a big move higher? That's definitely one to watch. Another example of that as well is uh, I thought was interesting was the Under Armour chart. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like uh, the, that stock uh, put in that, like a little double bottom and then just stayed flat and did nothing. Everyone started to ignore it. No one's paying attention. And look at that sneaky tortoise formation coming in here and starts taking off. Do you know why I like this one as well? The sneaky tortoise shouldn't really explode higher. He should grind higher like a tortoise. Yeah, and that's just, what this under is the doing. radar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to score you for coming up with the sneaky tortoise uh, uh, chart formation. I'm going to give you a nine out of ten. Nice. That's, uh, Thank that's, you. Uh, this, so you, you, two out of three so far. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you're, you're in for there. Now, this, uh, this one, the lethargic walrus, while <laughs> the name is great. Yeah, uh, you've been you snuck this in there to try to rename 
a chart pattern that's already a market huddle uh, core chart pattern. Oh, what is it's that? It's called the Muir Formation. <laughs> and and so you uh, you, uh, you try to rebrand the okay. Muir Formation. What is the it, Muir Formation though? So remember, it is it is the combination of of two patterns together. And let's let's use. In fact, even though it's named after you. In fact, I suffered in this case the Muir formation, um, and in this case, uh, the the way we'll start it, we'll start it with the euro, right? And so, in this case, I'm convinced that the euro's going lower, right? And uh, and the U.S. dollar bull is imminently going to come, and then comes the uh, the rhino, and uh, the the death by short selling, and then I eat it. Yeah. Right, and that that comes in there, and then I'm just waiting for that U.S. dollar to begin its bull market, and it just doesn't come. Right, it's just going on in there, and that's where we flip the pattern for the second leg, uh, which it ends with uh, the pelican formation, and and so this is where you know you you get trapped into the pelican's mouth. And uh, and it's like no, it's going to be a bottom, and then this and that, and then the pelican swallows the chart. God. Okay. The pelican formation. I have to say it three times, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so I just had uh, a tribute to to a picture of, of a pelican here, but but th so you get a fail on this chart pattern because you were trying to uh, to rebrand an existing pattern okay. that existed. So I'm two out of four. Two out of four. So so, so the this last is the tiebreaker. This is a tiebreaker. So uh, this is the bite down on the pillow pop, and. Uh, <laughs> It's too long, but Come on. It, but but it's good. Okay. It's 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 a good name, but it's a little yeah. I mean, how I guess uh, I guess it does happen uh, frequently enough. I mean, it, it, like some SPAC or something will come well, along. It's, that, it's a lot of these low float stocks are happening all the time. Yeah, the bite down on the pillow pop is occurring all the time, Patrick. Right, every and single so, day we're getting one of these. So, I have to say that you're uh, you. Three out of five. Well, Three out of five. Kind of and so we're, we're building the library, and soon we'll publish the, uh, the Market Huddle chart book, uh, chart formation book, so nice. that it, we, we can publish it out there. You, uh, you added three patterns that I think uh, will we'll make it into, uh, into the book. Patrick, right. I have a question for you. Yeah. Does this uh, get me any closer to my chartered market technician? No, uh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's... You, you shitting on technical analysis is uh, it's it's just too much. No, just kidding. <laughs> so I, I, you know what? We'll save it for next week, uh, and I'm going to take you on on defending technical analysis. But uh, I, I'll, I'll let you I don't, think. About I, I love it. I, I love oh it. yeah, except when I'm not on the air to defend it, and then you <laughs> you spend like ten minutes shitting on it in uh, in the show. Well, listen, Morris had the all time greatest line. And I don't well, know if you heard it or remembered it. He said, uh, at the bottom of the ocean, every ship that's sunk, there's a I, chart I, There's a chart in the, in the <laughs> captain's quarters. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, Something all like right. that. He did it with more style and panache than I uh, did, Of but, course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You butchered it. But that's yeah. that's normal for us. Yeah. Uh, so – just let's let's quickly look at a few other charts I wanted to look at. So this was interesting. S and P five hundred. You know what? Listen, I won't I won't lie that when that market was rallying in August, I got uber bearish, and uh, and we we both actually went short right at the top, and uh, I just thought this correction could last a little bit longer into the election. Uh, and uh, no, it didn't. It bounced higher. And so far, the entire pattern that we saw in the last uh, week still has bull characteristics of a, uh, of a flagging formation, which, uh, which is usually after impulse higher in the markets, the market just takes a break from just being overdone, but they don't give back a, a big chunk. And so like, it'll be interesting. I mean, obviously, the ele elections are going to be a big and it's going to be in play. Uh, and that's going to create some volatility. So, I, you know, technical analysis will have its shortcoming there. But so far, the chart has is not looking very bearish. And so it is uh, that. It, I wanted to also that, talk about um, uh, uh, copper, right? Okay. And uh, uh, so the, co uh, easy the there, copper. Easy there, I don't want you goochering my trade. It's a breakout, right? Oh, uh, it's a breakout. 
And now 325 was the measured move on the upside. It's pausing. What what would be very bullish this week, uh, upcoming week, is if uh, the bulls defended uh, all a consolidation solidly above three and th uh, particularly if they can keep it above like 305, 310, where like the, the it, just like what we were seeing on the S&P, if like could be just a little sideways consolidation that becomes the midpoint for a nice breakout. It's worth watching to see whether that happens. But uh, the other one I want to touch on is this uranium, right? Now this uranium participation unit, which uh, I, mean, I know Cuppy was talked about in the past and, and uh, we've uh, highlighted numerous times. This is like a, a, a corporation that simply holds uh, uranium. Yep. And, uh, and they, it trades uh, either at a net asset, uh, sorry, at a premium or a discount to its net asset value. Yeah. And what's interesting is that when you look at where we are on this, uh, right now, uh, the, uh, the implied price of the uranium held in that uh, corporation is selling at a 20% discount to where uranium is. And even though uranium has been in the gutter, the, they've been really almost diverging and that spread is pretty much as wide as it's been in a while. Uh, what's your thinking here? Is, is this uh, an, uh, the opportunity to act? Well... Patrick, it's funny that you bring up uranium. I have something to tell you. Oh, no. You didn't take a long, did you? No. While you're away, I cheated on you with another podcast. And I actually went on and talked about uranium. And I argued that this was a great long. Well, I guess I didn't Did you? That. Yeah. Obviously, you don't so, listen to that podcast. No, I, I, um, I don't listen to that other <laughs> podcast. What, 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 what was it called again? No, just... <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, no. I just I just uh, fast forwarded past uh, all the parts. Where That's you what talk. I do every it's, week it's with too, you as well. It's, it's, um. it's too it's too weird. <laughs> like you know what? Have you and Eric talking together? It's like uh, it's like having your wife and your mistress having a conversation. It's too weird. It's a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I, Anyways, I, I did talk about uranium participation unit. It is uh, not only is it a discount to spot. Don't forget the spot is at a discount to the forwards. Yeah. So to me, it has it's a double discount. It's kind of like double secret probation, and uh, there's usually good things happen when you're under double secret probation. <laughs> There you go. So it's it's uh, nice to see that it, it's some – the chart is shit though. But it is that, shit. I guess in technical terms, that is a shit chart. Like lower highs, lower lows. Some Somebody's unloading it. Uh, so you know, I mean, I guess it's not enough liquidity and somebody has to sell, right? It's uh, – anyway. So let's move on. The um, grains. Oh, God. Like, uh, are, we you, had, are, are you like you going out of your way to just goocher every single one of my trades today? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? If you're making money, I'm, I'm jealous, and so I, I, I want to gooch her as much shit as possible here. So, but uh, like wheat just continues to to work really well. Corn, like what a move corn's been having. But uh, mind you, the measured move on corn finishes here in this uh, four twenty four thirty zone. So you got to be careful uh, as as it reaches here. It's overdue slowly for it. Um, that's it. To, that's to like potentially, to uh, but, uh, potentially, yeah. it's going to pause. I don't okay. want to say it's going to be bearish, but yeah. typically after a move of this, it pauses and consolidates. Soybean, though, has um, just broken out of a, a, a two-week consolidation to a, fr a fresh high here, 52-week high. And that, those, that kind of breakout measures to about 1120 on the upside. A little bit more room for these to go. Huh. Sorry, buddy. Uh, you know what? I wish that they were still open. We're taping this at 4.30. I think they're all closed. I can't hit any Globex bids, but I'll be doing that Sunday night. Sorry, sorry buddy. <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, so so that that's uh, that's what I wanted to cover. Was there any oh, – oh, we got to touch on some of these uh, earnings. Intel, uh, obviously 10% gap lower. The last time – uh, Intel gapped. It sold for about five days afterwards and then kind of started to consolidate. Uh, there's some uh, obvious uh, support lines down here, but this is still very negative. Like maybe there is only uh, another like, uh, let's say, 10 percent downside. But uh, it's it's such a weak chart. The, the so, fact that it gapped this way is you Patrick, buy some Intel. No, Intel's like my uh, I know this is a talking chart segment and I don't want to be putting fundamentals in here. Because uh, you don't believe yeah, in those kind of things, but oh uh, my god, no! But uh, the thing that makes me mad is I I was super bearish Intel, and it and it basically was my trigger point was when 
Apple went and said they're no longer they were going to start making their own chips. I think that's a big yeah. deal. I think that the people don't realize that Intel is is just gradually losing the the, the market losing share. the battle. And I think that Intel was a terrific sale, continues to be a sale. I think it's going to be grinding lower. And I'm such yeah. a mope for not being short this thing because. Uh, well, if you it, get a little bit of a fib retrace, you can always uh, you can always hammer it on you know a little the, bit of a pop. Yeah. So uh, I wanted I wanted to touch on here, but another uh, legacy one there is IBM, and uh, that one missed on its earnings, or at least gapped on its earnings lower, and uh, it looks like a very heavy chart. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, with it breaking all the all the high volume node zones on uh, on this thing right here are in this consolidation right right in here, and so what you have, and that's where the for those not familiar with this, that's just identifying where the majority of the volume transacted at, right, and um, and so with the fact that we are below this zone. Uh, it leaves a pretty big air pocket for it to even weaken back down to its lows. These, uh, these like, and Cisco has been another one that's uh, a legacy one that's uh, showing your age. You're picking all these old socks. Yeah, like the the old ones. Only Microsoft you know like, what, is the though, only one that. Patrick, that, and here I got a question for you. And yeah, yeah. I probably know the answer, but I think it's more than just these ones. These are ones that are leading on the way on the way down. But even some of the high flyers. The fast lease, the crowd strikes, uh, the yeah, Salesforce—they're yeah. all rolling yeah, over. Yeah, so so that's the chart. Like we should we should talk about this. This it's this uh, is it the rollover of the value momentum trade. Okay, and that's, so what you're tell people what we're looking at here. So this is I'm going to reverse it. So I'm going to look at value. So that we what we're doing is we're taking the ETFs for the value uh, uh, versus the momentum factor uh, uh, ETFs. Okay, and so we're dividing one by the other to. Show the uh, the relative the, performance. The relative of that. performance of so, those two. So, you know, value's been getting crushed. It's been terrible. This week we had, uh, or actually the past couple of weeks, we've had kind of value getting a bid. The real question I have for you is, if we do get a rotation, and we get these large tech stocks selling off, and it eventually goes to the Amazons, the uh, the yeah. Facebook, and all those, can like so far the market has been able to hang in there. Because, you know, as the KRE and all the other things go up, those other ones are kind of drifting a little bit lower, but there's been no problem. But can we have a serious rotation in the market? Could we have the tech stocks down 20% in a week or two and have the stock market unchanged or down five? Or if they're down 20%, are no, they going no, the market the cap, market down? No, the market cap weighted system is so uh, so heavily tilted toward those fangs that if the fangs go, it's even if the value stocks are working, the index itself is going to be underwater. Uh, like I, it doesn't okay, mean so that there the is a, side of your there's, there's going to be there's going to be places to hide, yeah. uh, but I just don't think that the, the index won't be able to hold up. So I don't think it'll hold up, but it'll go down. The question is, will it go down? Oh my god! Yeah. Why but, don't we save this for a bet? Like uh, because oh, I should have uh, done that. But anyways, okay. But anyways, I'll just you know, Patrick, you and I are on this other side of the trade. I think that we can have a rotation that hurts a lot of people, but doesn't result in the stock market getting clopped for ten or fifteen yeah, percent. Yeah. The other so, one that you were talking about before was that XOP QQQ. You, uh, you think that that was to turn those energy stocks a lot a little pop? I don't I, know. I mean, the big energy stocks still look like crap. I, it's kind of some other like Canadian names that have got a bit bit, bit to them. And it's, you know, not gas is what it looks really good. Like, yeah. really, that's what you should be trading. That's the stock. That's what's telling you. Oh, yeah, for sure. By the way, Tesla gave back the entire rally on its earnings. Do you, uh, that to, to usually for me, when you have a gap higher on the news and then the sellers just give it to them, that's usually a sign that this is getting heavy. Uh, do you, are you bearish on Tesla from that? I'm bearish from on that the whole process? EV space. I think the, the top was made. Right. And, I, and right. I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to be a lot lower. Uh, so you, the last one, and then we'll go on. Chipotle Mexican Grill uh, goes, and, and this is actually a fun chart to talk about because goes in double tops, has its earnings, gaps lower. A lot of times those kind of gaps trigger uh, uh, what, uh, as technicians, we look at like a breakaway gap that potentially can create a feedback loop that, creates a distribution cycle and uh, and what the one thing that always i watch for in the day after is can the bulls reverse the gap 
and, uh, and uh, put it back into a neutral spot from that negative signal. And uh, they did it. They reversed it. Now, I'm not, I'm not actually – I am actually quite neutral here. But the fact that they did this, I'd, I'd be more bearish Tesla than I would be Chipotle, at least from the few days of price action that we've been seeing. Uh, so far, the bulls have done a half-decent job of actually defending that. And that's it. Yeah. Patrick, time for this week in trading history. I missed it last week. What do you got for us? Well, yeah, you did. So it's not this week in trading history. It's last week in trading history because you were supposed to do it and you didn't. <laughs> I like letting our guests talk more. So I just let our guests talk. It's way uh, easier for me. It's way easier for you. Anyway, so in this week in trading history, we talk about what happened last week in history. Uh, and so uh, w what we do is um, c considering we're quickly approaching that spooky time at the end of October, and I'm not ta referring to the uh, U.S. elections, uh, we're, we're, um, uh, we want to think about and talk about this ghoulish Black Friday mini crash that happened in, on this week in history, or last week in history, on Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th of 1989. And so on the morning of that uh, superstitious day, the market suddenly turned down on very heavy volume and dropped like a stone until the closing bell. Just from top to bottom, straight day of selling, the Dow shed almost 7%, S&P down 6%, and it left traders scratching their heads as to the potential catalyst of how this little mini uh, down day uh, happened. And so if you listened uh, to the news cycle in the days that followed the crash, you would have heard it was apparently a reaction to the uh, breaking story of the collapse of a $6.75 billion, $6 billion leverage buyout deal uh, for UAL Corporation, which is the parent company of United Airlines, which then triggered the, uh, the cratering of the junk bond market back then. And uh, on, so on a side note, the, UAA, the UAL deal unraveled because the management overseeing the deal refused to agree to terms requested by the flight attendant union uh, who were requesting equivalent terms to other labor groups. So it's a classic Wall Street fund rope-a-dope uh, collapse a market due to poor management and blaming the working class. Anyway, uh, back to the Black Friday. The reason this uh, failed deal narrative doesn't make sense is because the market actually started dropping before the breakdown in negotiations. Instead, the two main contributors of the crash were actually an excess dependence on uh, high-frequency trading algos that were in their infancy and growing in popularity, and of course, uh, the age-old human psychology element of blindly following the crowd. This was uh, confirmed by telephone survey in the days after the crash when market professionals were asked if they had heard about the UAL news before or after the drop. The response uh, was that 36% heard ab uh, about the deal fallout before the crash and 53% cent said it was afterwards. So then why did the market crash? Uh, or had at least a mini crash there. And uh, so a think tank, because the think tanks always figure it out, report and <laughs> summarized three factors, right? And so the first one, which I think is complete nonsense, but uh, was that the ratio of stock dividends to stock prices that reached record low levels relative to the interest available on U.S. government securities. You call bullshit on that one? I don't know, Patrick. <laughs> All right. I, so, I was more I was more interested in my New Order albums. <laughs> and so uh, it was uh, oh, the second one was uh, that it was uh, professional money managers who fell into a herd instinct. Uh, did uh, they feel safer making the same mistake everyone else was rather than uh, one highlighting their own unique incompetence? Uh, it was, uh, was it the big herd thing of just everyone hitting sell, too much leverage? Or third was a theory of the so-called illusion of liquidity, a foolish confidence in one's ability to buy or sell quickly at the market price. One version of the illusion theory is that many uh, institutional investors thought that using stock index futures would get them out of their position faster um, than the market fell, except that when it, it doesn't apply when everyone does the same thing at the same time. Right, Kev? There's no bids. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, this crash uh, contributed to the implementation of the circuit breakers we know today, 
which automatically stop trading when prices uh, hit predefined levels. For example, the S&P circuit breakers today trigger at 7%, 13%, and 20% on intraday moves. Uh, but so as for the fallout of the Black Friday crash, it is often pinpointed as the start of that recession uh, in the early 1990s. And around that time, there was, were surprisingly low growth rates, almost 0% during the summer months, and uh, a long brewing savings and loans crisis that would eventually see the failure of over a thousand savings and loans institutions that uh, made it uh, uh, big in the news cycle. Uh, so these two culprits uh, would form the narrative blamed by the public as the true culprits of the recession, although we don't uh, have uh, time to go into the junk bond market failure that happened during that crash. I think we can summarize it with a very timely Halloween joke. Let's see if I can pull this off. You could say Black Friday really put the boo in junk boons. No, Ooh. you can't. No, it was you horrible. Can't. No, it was so bad. It was so bad. I'm going to just... All right, so it's time for the WTF clip of the week. Taylor, hop on, bud. What do you have for us? All right. So this week I've got, uh, it's actually a really great clip from, uh, uh, it's got Jim Cramer and some other guy. <laughs> you guys would know him. We've, got, we've featured you know, him before. I, I think I think Jim Cramer has uh, made it onto our uh, WTF clips the most frequently of, of everyone else. What I, like, right? I, what I like best is Taylor's got some other guy, you'd know him. I think it's David Faber. <laughs> It's not. It's not yeah. like some nobody. It's David Faber. Okay, so yeah, it's yeah. Jim Cramer and David Faber. I mean, yeah. If you guys still watch terrestrial TV, that's cool. That's cool. I mean, I'm a personal cord cutter, but that's just me because I'm under forty. So we're watching this, right? And it's a classic. Who's on first uh, scene? Like these guys. He's just like, you know what it is. He's like, I thought that wasn't what it is. And you're like, holy jeez. You know, we're paying these guys. <laughs> like, how much are these guys making? Although. They're great. They bring a lot of value. I like them. Please enjoy this clip. This is a new thing in our market. We have younger people who worship stocks. I don't think they're worth worshiping. They are pieces of paper. Look at Tesla, David. Come on. Look at that. Yeah, I see it. I've been watching it. $415 billion well, market. What do you make of that? I mean, stocks, by the way, are no longer pieces of paper, just so you know. They're, well, what do you, they're, they're, what are they're they? They're nothing. They're just, I mean, nothing. does anybody really get a stock certificate anymore? Does That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. Go ahead and add it up. Every cent's accounted for. Look. See this? That's a car. 275 thou. Might want to hang on to that one. I, it's not like, David, they're buying uninformed. They're not uninformed. They have done work in the sense of they know what the companies do. I got worms. We're going to specialize in selling worm farms. Wait, they, who? They know what the companies do. Who, the Robin Hooders? Yeah, they do. What do you mean? I thought we've sat here and talked about how they don't know well, what the no, do. no, they know what it does. They don't necessarily know the P.E. They don't care about price to sales, the things that they used to care about. They know what Snowflake does. Oh, look, Frost. Uh, maybe not. All right. <laughs> so, oh, man. So what I like that best is like, you know, Dumb and Dumber. That's just a classic, awesome movie. It's uh, it's so fitting. Like, yeah. anyway. No, he did. Taylor it, it did was, a great job on it. It was really Oh my great. god, I, yeah, loved it. Loved I don't it. know Taylor. I've, I, I, don't, I probably haven't told you the story about this, but you know that scene where they do "How's Your Burger," yeah, right. And when they, for those yeah. who haven't seen the movie or those who are, are too smart not to watch it, um, uh, <laughs> there's a scene where the two guys, the Dumb and Dumber guys, they they go and they stick in all these hot peppers and hot sauce into the guy's burger, or they at least they think they do. And then the guy's eating it and they say, how's your burger? And it ends up being that he's not eating it right or I can't remember the whole scene. But the funny part about this story is this happened to me when I was in uh, – this movie came out while we were on the trading floor. We, you know, we were late 20s or whatever. We thought this was hilarious. And so whenever someone got stuffed with a trade, that was always the line that we'd come up and go, how's your burger? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. That's, Anyways, that's good. thanks for the WTF. I really like that yeah. one. Of course, guys. We'll have a good one. Love it. All right. So, Lena, hop on here. It's time for the no stupid questions. Only stupid answers. <laughs> <laughs> you can, 
you we have a, we have a few questions today. Yeah, it's gonna um, be fun. Now that Patrick's back, we have a a couple more, I think. Than All usual. right, let's do it. So the first question: Howdy, fellas. When SoftBank was buying all of those calls that was making the market makers go and buy the underlying stock, my question is, what if it was reversed and SoftBank was buying lots of put options? What would be the market maker's response to that? Okay, so Patrick, you want to do it or me? You do it. Okay, so uh, it, the, the first answer, the first part of the answer is it would be the exact opposite. The, so, the market makers, they would be selling them puts and to hedge that they would have to go and short sell stock. But yeah. the one part about it is that what everyone was focused on was what's known as the gamma, meaning that because the market makers had sold the options, as the market moved up, they had to buy more stock. And as the mo market moved down, they would have to sell more stock. The gamma from that position, assuming the same strikes, would have been exactly the same or very close to the same. So that is the one thing that you need to understand is that when – the clients buy options from the market makers. It makes them short gamma. And that is the part that most people are focusing on. Yeah. But you're right that the, the initial reaction, the initial thing would be that they would actually have to hedge it with a short sale. Right. Right. All right. Question number two. This, Lena, is a, this is a long question. There's two part question. So the first part of this question is, Independent trader here running my own funds in addition to family f portfolio. My one real concern is how do I manage this when life events pop up that pull my attention elsewhere? I don't have anyone to take over for me for a few days, let alone a few weeks, so I'm looking for suggestions. I've been doing this a few years, but I haven't figured out what to do about this part of the job. I, th I think uh, let's, put, let's, let's read the next part, Lena. Oh, so the next part uh, part of this question is, since both Kevin and Patrick have worked as independent traders, I wanted to know how do you know it's time to step away from the desk and attend to other matters? Are there specific signs you notice in yourself when you might need to shift your focus? How do you handle it? Do you have rules about getting flat, cut positions that aren't high conviction or simply put in some stop losses and low ball orders and walk away hoping for the best? Do you handle it differently than when you go on vacation? Love the show. Keep up the great work. It's rare to be informative and as funny as the show is. Props especially to Lena. Thank you. Oh. For nailing the tone with the editing or not editing, depending on which is funnier. <laughs> okay. So let's you go have to leave that part they're in kind there. of the same. I, yeah. I, I actually yeah. maybe should have answered them one at a time. Lena, Do you want to go first? Uh, go first? Well, Patrick, I took the first one. Why don't you start with about how to <coughs> manage the family and the other kind of life so, events? So generally, uh, I categorize my trading as, as positions that I have that are more longer dated. Now, I tend to be uh, long a lot of options. And so I, ha uh, so I usually have a very defined risk in advance. Uh, but I tend to unwind anything that has to be short-term managed. Or I roll it out or I hedge it. And, and leave a lot of my longer dated positions. I'm not going to create tax dispositions and other things just because I'm stepping away. So I try to de-risk the portfolio, uh, and especially the stuff that I would have to manage on the short term. And then I, uh, and then I w walk away. Right? And so I, that's the way I manage it. I don't go right to cash or anything. How about you? So I'm just trying to look at this question and think about how to answer it. It is going to depend a lot on how your what your trading is like and there are some people who can walk away and it doesn't it, it doesn't affect them because the time frame from their trades is measured in weeks and months and those people it shouldn't matter if you're trading in days or hours then i'm with patrick that the reality is that if you have some sort of family matter where you have to step away and like fly overseas or whatever, you have to go make sure that you're not um, you're not trading is in essence what you have to do because you can't do both. And I've learned the hard way that even on vacations that I'll go and try to trade a little on vacation and that's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You end up not being rested and not trading very well. And so, your head's not in the game. Yeah. Like you, you just like what happens, I find that even when I'm not 
at my main office and I'm trading even from a hotel or somewhere else, I, just being in a different environment screws me up. Oh, yeah. And you know, there's lots of times like I know traders that they'll get a new uh, new computer and that the, that first day when every when the screens are different or something, they don't like it. Because their yeah. their brain's not used to seeing it in a specific spot, and they need to get used to it. Or when they go away for a month and they come back, the first day they'll often go slow because they'll be, or even for a week or two, they'll come back and they'll go slow for a first few days because they feel like they're not uh, tuned in like they usually are. Okay, let's it's, go to the next parts thing. here. Are there specific signs you notice in yourself when you might need to shift your focus? And do you have rules about getting flat, cut positions that are high conviction? So I guess if this is back to the question of something that's like on your mind, you're going through a personal uh, uh, event, then I would say that if in doubt, you should cut it. You should always remember that there's lots of time to make money, but it's really hard to, to make it back once you've lost it. I know that, for example, there's a rule in the hedge fund community that this one hedge, uh, this uh, fund of funds guy had that he said whenever a trader or a portfolio manager was going through a divorce, he would always take money away from them because I think there's some study that they underperform by a huge amount. And uh, the one thing that's funny about this is that he thought uh, he was invested in David Einhorn's Green Light Fund. And he thought, oh, no, David could handle it. And sure enough, David blew up or not blew up. David had struggled during his divorce as well. The reality is we're all human and it is difficult when you're going through those personal matters. So I would say if you're at all in doubt, err on the side of trading smaller when there's personal things going on. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. yeah. It's uh, – oh, listen – uh, there, there is nothing worse than, uh, than you know, when you don't have your natural groove, and uh, and you especially what what I find is is that um, it's, it's that saying that we've said numerous times. Uh, you you brought it onto the show, and it's, it's something we've talked about on the huddle all the time. You got to slay your dragons while they're small, right? right. And uh, and one of the things that I find that always gets uh, me out of sync is if I let a trade go uh, farther or longer than it, I should have, and then it just I can't focus on the other opportunities out there. Uh, what I've found is sometimes even I will flatten a position, and a week later I'll buy it back in, but I'll kind of take a, a fresh look at it and take a break, reset my my thinking, and then I'll uh, I'll come in and look at it as a, a scratch trade as opposed to uh, sitting in the hole, and then you manage it completely differently, right? right? Well, that's the famous yeah. story about George Soros phoning up Goldman Sachs and asking for us. He used to fax over his whole um, – his whole portfolio and say, bid me on the whole thing. And they would bid him on the whole thing Friday afternoon. He would be flat. And then he would rebuild his portfolio from scratch Monday morning because yeah. he just wanted a fresh view. And back to the slaying your dragons. One thing I've learned is that when your dragon gets medium size, the chances of him shrinking back and going to small is a lot lower than that dragon turning into just a monster that, you know, that makes yeah. Puff the Magic Dragon look like a little, like, uh, you know, tiny little reptile. <laughs> right. so, the, the, right. so that is great advice. Slay your dragons when they're small. Anyways, hopefully All we right. answered that uh, reader's question. Perfect. Lena. So the last question is, what level of volatility gets you interested in looking at back ratio spread trades? Selling, for example, at an uh, at the money call option and buying two or three out of the money call options relative to what can be financed by the initial option sale. Probably easiest to use the S&P 500 and associated VIX as a general proxy for levels of vol. However, what I'm really looking at is setting up a one or two year back ratio call spread on crushed ETFs like XES. For example, on September 8th, 2020, the 19th of March, 2021 at the money calls have vol around 60% and out of the money vol in ratio at 50% with an increase in price of 75% required to break even. However, I'd be expecting a double or a triple. Is this just dumb and best to wait for volatility in the market to get back down to, say, fix at or below 30? Right. So, uh, Kev, you want me to take this? Uh, yeah. So, you should start. 
And, uh, okay, and then you know, first of all, let's just explain uh, what uh, the, uh, the back spread. Yeah. And so the back spread, you try to uh, to put on a trade that co- essentially costs you zero, and you're in in the case of buying calls, you're buying a right tail upside. And we, with puts, you're buying the left tail upside, which is basically there's a pocket. Actually, I think you have a chart here that yeah. that shows it right here. See the uh, the in the case of um, oh, wait, the call Patrick, before you explain this, Patrick. Yeah. Explain, like so, you'd short. Let's just go to the. the let's slide. go through the logistics. So yeah, so let's let's just go through it. We, what we're doing is we're uh, selling a call option. So you're uh, uh, before you go and buy anything else. You're you're selling a call option, which uh, right at the money, which is the equivalent. Um, um, is naked. You're naked yep. this call. And then you use all of the income proceeds you made from it to buy two or more. Actually, it could be any ratio. It could be one and a half. It could be 10. It doesn't matter. You're buying more call options with the proceeds out of the money than you uh, than you have of the one that is at the money that you're short of. Right. And the whole point is, is that you're long gamma, you're long volatility, and if the price breaks out in a big way above the upper strikes, um, uh, then you you have a big payoff. Now, right. and if it goes uh, lower, in, you don't lose anything because it basically yeah. costs you nothing. So, so here um, uh, our our listener was referencing particularly the XES, uh, and uh, what, but he was also referencing the fact that uh, he was looking at something setting up a one or two year. Uh, back uh, ratios call spread. So now here's the XES, and he was uh, he was looking for uh, this turn. I what I felt we we should do is we should go to the XOP, and uh, the XOP uh, uh, is essentially also another one of the spider ETFs. This is uh, the oil and gas exploration. But the reason why I like the XOP is because it does have that one year option, so we can kind of put uh, put on. A um, an example of a back spread uh, that is zero cost uh, or very close to zero cost on this. We actually now, did a two year option on our example that we're going to walk through. Uh, was it a two year? Yeah, oh, was Jan uh, 2022. That's uh, that's just over a year. That's not two years. Well, it's it's uh, what fifteen months. Oh, I guess you're right. It's okay. Right? I don't it's work just, with numbers it, for a living, so it yeah, doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and so, uh, so the. Um, <laughs> So actually, we'll show it on the chart. But first, let's let's look at the example we built. So here, uh, what you what you did on the Bloomberg is you, you plugged it in here. We went to the 2022. What we did was we shorted the 45 call, and just for the sake of keeping it simple, we just bought two of the 60s. Now everyone's immediately thinking, "Oh my God, fifteen dollars higher, sixty bucks." Uh, that uh, seems so far away. But when you look at this chart. Uh, sixty dollars. I mean, we were at seventy just back in June. Like the the this energy sector is like super volatile, and so let's just say one is uh, structurally bullish, but really bullish. You think that the energy sector can uh, go a hundred percent or two hundred percent on the upside from here, and so what we're you know, what you're doing is we're selling this forty five call here, and buying twice as many of these 60, 60s. And the key, and we'll talk about it in the chart here, I'll let you take over, but is that we uh, we need a legitimate breakout north of 60 so that those the where you're long all those extra calls and the extra gamma, you're, you're going to build that big intrinsic value in those out-of-the-money calls. And so you have to be super bullish to open a, a call spread. Now, his question before we, we get to this, and I'll let you explain it, uh, is is that what's the right volatility? And this is where I think we have to make one key distinction between uh, a put back spread versus a call back spread because of the nature of volatility trends. Now, I mean, you've identified periods where volatility diverges, but the general trend is that during market declines, volatility expands, and generally during periods of stability and markets rallying, there's volatility contraction. And therefore, a callback spread, since you're long volatility or long vega, as, this, uh, as the security is going up, you're fighting volatility compression or, or volatility declining. While typically when you have a put spread on a uh, back spread, you're, you're profiting or benefiting from being long volatility during a decline. So the first comment I'll make to our, our listener here about this is the fact that by doing it as a callback spread, even though it's a zero cost, you are going to get tagged by volatility contraction more often than not 
in, in being in this position. So what, 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 do you say, what, what would you want to contribute to that, Well, I, I went through and I made some charts so that we can see how it behaves and how different Greeks behave. And uh, let's go to the first one here, which is the position P&L versus price. And when yep. we look at this chart, you'll see that there's four different lines. What those four different lines, Patrick, next slide, please. There we go. What those four different lines represent is different periods in time. The purple being today, the yellow being forward, like March 23rd, 2021. And then the next, the orange being uh, August 22nd. And then finally, the green being the expiry. Yep. And I'll let you know, this is what you were mentioning is that this position, if you look at the blue line, which is where we start, it basically is... Um, the p l is a slight credit, meaning that you make a tiny little bit of money if uh, if it closes here. But then as it goes up and to the point where if it closes at, at 60 at expiry, that's the point of maximum pain and you'll actually lose there. Yeah. Now, having said right. that, what you need to recognize is that this position, that's at expiry, which is still a year and a bit away, not two years. And you'll see that what you'll the, the purple line represents the PL as you know today. And so don't forget it's shifting downward, but as the, the price is moving higher, you can actually make money there. Now, right. so let's go to the next slide, which shows you your delta. This is basically the position delta versus uh, again versus time, but also with that um, you know the bottom uh, axis being the price. So you'll see at the beginning, it's actually, it's a, the delta is positive, and right. then it gets more and more positive, which pa Patrick referenced as it goes higher, right? So that's the, the, the point you were trying to make is that it is a positive delta position. But the really important one here, this is what you were trying to show, is this next one, which is Vega, which is the sensitivity to volatility. This I did against price, and you'll see that you get, as it rallies, you get more and more vega, meaning that your position is more and more sensitive to the implied volatility of the, of the options. The trouble is that as it goes higher, chances are that that implied Balls volatility will go down. Right. And that was what and Patrick was trying to, sh to kind of point out, and that's why this, this strategy is you almost tricky. have to put it on no, no but you have to almost put it on with the anticipation that you're going to get hit on the vol like you you that should be your base case you should if you're going in on a um, call back spread and assume that volatility will stay the same you have to be pretty much already at a very low vol level right right and uh and so that uh that right there is, uh, is, I guess, the best way to do that. So hopefully we answered your question there. Uh, and thank you. Lena, is there anything else that we, uh, we forgot? Or you, you just, where do they uh, submit their questions? <laughs> Thanks to everyone submitting their questions. If you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Just stupid answers. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. All right. All right, Kev. It's time. Skin in the game. Yeah. So. Oh my God! I am. So, I just need to thank Morris. <laughs> you got ripped off. For, like I, I told like, to, like first of all, Cuppy did a great job covering me. You yeah. know, he took the right side of the trade. Yeah. Uh, and, you managed uh, to squeak out a win. I squeaked out a win. What did I get? A pitcher or something? Yeah, what did, what did you guys buy? I think it was a pitcher or something like that. Well, we got to start drinking these because oh, at know, some point it's going to be like I'm not allowed to test, be with you. Yeah, it's true. It's yeah. true. But but Morris puts like four to one odds. So like, how do you the, totally asymmetric for you not to take that deal? Like, I mean, what you you bet a dollar on a Duke and Duke, and I owe you a freaking pitcher. I don't know. Like, something thanks like a that. lot, Morris. So Listen, why don't Morris, we say what the trade was? <laughs> Pull yeah, it up right. here and see. Uh, did so yeah. it was this. Morris gave me two numbers. He gave me the Nasdaq at eleven five hundred, and the VIX at twenty eight bucks. And I had right. to guess that we would settle higher or lower in each one of them. And I could go. I didn't have to be both higher and both lower. It could have been one higher, one lower. And if I won and got both, I would get a four to one payoff. 
And unfortunately <sighs> for Patrick, <sighs> I chose up on the NASDAQ and down on the VIX. I did, I and the a, VIX I, was trading above 28. I know. Like, I, I didn't until think the I was last win. half an hour. I didn't think I was The last win. half an hour. And then the freaking thing uh, just drops like 70 cents in the final. Like, let I me know. put it on it a five minute Friday, chart. It is like, the this Friday is, afternoon. The VIX. Uh, like, look, it's five minute chart. It started. Le- that was me uh, wailing away on VIX trying to win the bet. <laughs> yeah, it started here like at 1320 and just. <laughs> And just like ah, <sighs> so okay. Oh, this is such so BS. you lose such another one. BS. So let all right, me, why don't you explain the rules? Yeah, uh, let me do this. Skin in the game is our weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy gets to choose which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by the next episode, and the currency for the wagers is as follows: a Duke and Duke, which is the crisp American one dollar bill, a pint of beer. And then it goes up to a burger bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, two four, a bottle of wine with a hundred dollar limit, but there really should be a minimum for Patrick, and <laughs> steak dinner. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. And here's the most right. important part: it's like the old days in before the great financial crisis. There will be no netting of positions, and all wagers will be physical in full. delivery. That's right. Physical delivery, just yeah. like uh, just like crude oil futures. Yeah. Well, no, but but they let you net in crude oil futures, and uh, uh, yeah. will be no this netting. So if I win two cases no of netting. beer and Patrick wins five, we're going to be drinking seven cases of beer. That is how it's going to work. All right. That's so it it's my turn, right? Well, yeah. So you won. So you're the one who presents. I get to pick, right? Yeah. So I want you to pull up, and just so you know, we do not organize these in advance. Patrick so has I, no I, idea what he's going to do. What I'm going to do. Uh, uh, I'm going to pick a little stock called Vernado, V-N-O. Are you familiar with it? V- V-N-O. Uh, no, I am not. V- okay, well, I'm going to let you N-O. go do a little bit of like pull up the chart, learn about it, think Realty about it. Realty trust. Okay. Okay. All right. So so here we are. Okay. So so is it just on the price? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you what they do just so you understand this the thing. Vernado Realty Trust is a fully integrated real estate investment trust. The trust owns, manages, and leases office properties in New York City, Chicago, and San Francisco. All right. Okay, now let me get my levels here. I like the one touch. That's what I'm going for. Oh, my God. So so the one touch, and unfortunately, I got to pick something. I know you're always leading bearish, so I got to figure something out. Ah, It's really tough. I use my technical, you know, skills. And I've come up with the following price, and it's a one touch, and you get to choose. 30.66. 30.66 right here. So it's just a fresh low, but uh, no, I'm going to take the above. Oh, you are? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, I'm taking the above. I'm going to take the above. So, all right, so. The betting starts at the Duke and Duke. Yep. You get to uh, make the. Fr- do, I guess you get to make. The, oh no! I, or do I make the first? Uh, no, I race? get to uh, Duke and Duke. Uh, no, because you did it. I don't know. I'll go a pint of beer. Pint of beer. See now, just to make this clear. If if I take you to a burger bet, you have to accept the burger bet, or can you say I decline the raise? And I, I just decline the raise, the- and we stick at a pint of beer. You know what? We have so much beer, we're gonna get hungry. I'm t- I'm taking it up to a burger bet. <laughs> we gotta have a burger with the beer. Oh shit! I was really hoping you go the other way. I went too low, obviously. Um, Patrick, I'm not. I'm gonna leave it at a pint of beer. I'm sorry. I'm being wrong. <sighs> sorry, but uh, right. knowing when you're not, uh, I I went too low. I, I I obviously did not. Either that, or you're just wising up to my uh, my my thinking. Well, there's a there's a breakout candle that uh, should at least keep it boring for a week. Uh, it's not that it can't go lower, but I don't think by the end of next week. And especially, there's probably uh, going into elections. I don't know if there's going to be a big move. Things may just kind of anyway. We'll yeah. see. I would the bet's on. Bet's well, on. Th- it's thirty spot six six, right? Yeah, thirty spot six six. I chose the devil. There it hour. is. All right. So. Um, that's it. That's it. The show's a wrap. Well, it's oh. great to have you back, Patrick. I missed you. 
Oh, thanks, bud. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's nice to be back. Yeah. It's nice to be back. So, uh, what do we, what do we have to say here at the end again? Well, I'll do it. Uh, thanks for right. tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending the time with us. Please give us a follow at the Market Huddle on Twitter. Give Lena a shout out. She gets tired of pa- talking to Patrick and myself. You can listen to the Market Huddle on all the networks: Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all the charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. Ring the bell, as Lena tells me. And please, <laughs> if you could, rate and review us on iTunes. It's a dumb game, but it makes a difference to Apple's algorithms, and it helps us out immensely. Patrick, for those that are missing you and want to find out more about you, where can they find you? All right. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna or as well uh, at uh, bigpicturetrading.com. Kev, where can they find you? I'm at Kevin Muir, K-E-V-I-N-M-U-I-R. And uh, you can check out my blog at themacrotourist.com. And listen, you can never have too many friends, bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in and make sure you stick around for the after show. All right, hop on, youngins. Youngins. <laughs> you know, you're the only one that makes yourself sound much older by saying that, right? Come yeah. on here, youngins. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, what, t- Taylor, what did you uh, think of my assessment of the chart patterns? Oh, I loved it. I was actually, as you were talking about it, I was trying to Photoshop uh, Kevin's uh, head uh, into one of these patterns. <laughs> uh, but my skills were lacking. <laughs> It just looks like a big balloon, a big bald balloon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's some there's some pretty uh, pretty interesting pictures of you online there, Kevin, from uh, all the interviews you've done. Oh, great! It's, I know they're oh, terrible. This is true. This is one. very true. You, you know what? Lena has to. Um, uh, Lena has to. She always. I always say to her, "I need a better picture," and and I say, "Can you pick me out a good one?" And then she comes back and says, "No, I can't. There are none." <laughs> That's true. I'm like, we've already used all the ones that you thought was good. So, I actually need to take new have pictures a whole bunch that I took that I have waiting for, and I, I should get them going. I just hate that. Anyways, yeah. so listen, yeah, let's is. talk about the beer first of all. Yes. Serenity yes. Now. Serenity Now. It's got a, it's got a little bit of bite somehow, I don't, and, and I like it. Yeah, they said the bitterness. The bitter, that's it. It's light. bitterness. Uh, Patrick, you've been away. We'll let you go first. What do you think? I loved it actually. Oh. It was it was really good, and I, I I've tried to shy away from giving a beer a, a rating up in the nines, but I'm gonna give it a nine point one. Whoa! This is hey hey, whoa, 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 it, and whoa, I'm gonna whoa. use the word again. It's sessionable. Oh, I would buy a tw- <laughs> I would buy a two four. You know what? This is in fact when when you deliver that two four you owe me. Yeah. Actually, have we bet a two four? We haven't bet a two four yet. We should we? do it. We've we only have gone up to pictures, two, four, but. I think we've only done pictures so far. Lena, you're keeping track of this, right? Oh, I gotta, I gotta get back to that. Yes, sure. Okay, <laughs> but I, I would take a delivery of a two-four of this stuff. This is a nine-point-one, wow. and I have spoken. Kev, what did you think? I, I really liked it as well, and it's going to be really strange. I'm giving it an eight-nine. This will be like wow. the closest Patrick and I were ever to together on a beer. It's a lager, though, right? Like, so it's not like these uh, uh, these bitters and all these it's, other it's, stuff. That it's, we... it's a lager or not a liter. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Lena, what do you think? Um, I'm I'm going to go. Actually, you know, a full disclosure: I drank that beer when I was moving. <laughs> um, so I've been drinking a different you rem- beer right but now. But do you remember? But what I you remember. Liked it? I made a note of it. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, it was a little bit too hoppy for my taste. Oh. I was a little bit surprised. Uh, it was good, but it was a little bit too hoppy for me, so I would give it a 7.2. Oh, Ooh. that's weird. She shits on the beer. Lena and I are way off. Usually we're kind of closer. That's yeah. an inter- this is an interesting dynamic. Yeah, okay. I, I, yeah, I had to shotgun it, so. Oh. <laughs> so I, I think there's only one thing to talk about. Uh-oh. And uh, we're taping this Friday night, and I want to actually keep this short because I want to go watch Borat. How about you guys? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's on the list of things to do for tonight. Oh, my yeah. God. Did you see that Borat, they had a huge uh, float that came, they floated in. It was like he was on a barge in Toronto, and they floated him into downtown Toronto. No. What? Yeah. What was this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh Borat. Yeah, like the big rubber duck. You remember the big rubber duck yeah. that they brought in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. yeah it's the same type of thing. My, my friend at work was like, hey, check this out. And I just played along. I was like, why? Who's that? He's like, it's Borat. I'm like, who's Borat? He's like, you know. And I'm like, is that like the mayor? And he's like, what? No. Do you not know? Who, like, are, oh, you, okay. are you being sarcastic? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> you have to check. You have I to think check. it's going to yeah, be. Yeah. I can't wait. I think it's going to be hilarious. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, Luke's been bugging me to watch it. Yeah, so. for sure. Like, uh, you know. It's it's funny because like uh, Patrick actually I, I here enjoy, grab no, no no I enjoy I enjoy the comedy yeah uh, but I cringe at it, it it's just so, it's so uh, so over the top for me that it's like oh it's I can't a little uncomfortable it right? is uncomfortable it's very uncomfortable yeah. no no I agree uh, but I mean that's what he goes for the shock yeah. factor right? he want he t- he wants that reaction and it's uh, it, like I, I I watch it and it's like it's it's one of those where I'm at the edge of my seat like ready to leave the room. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I, what I think is interesting is that uh, the the lady, the lady actor in it, is actually getting rave reviews, and she did a terrific job. And like, it's really hard because you're in these awkward situations, you can't break character. I couldn't, yeah. like, I couldn't even come close to doing this shit he does. It's like you're like an improv actor, kind of, right? Like, you have yeah, to, you know, you're just, just not able to break character. And and anyway, so supposedly the woman that's this his sidekick that plays his daughter is just every bit as talented and does just as great a job as he does. So <laughs> I can't wait. I, I'm sure Rudy Giuliani doesn't yeah, think so. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. How stupid yeah. is that guy? Oh. Oh my God! Oh, okay, let's not get into politics. Well, just, like, into listen, politics, you can get into politics. You can say that guy is dumb as nails. Like, and I'll to say this: Trump, you know, he was one of the few that didn't fall for Borat. Like Borat tried him, and he figured it out and smelled him, you know, s- smelled it, and, and he left. So you got to give that guy credit for the very least for being street smart. Like you know, yeah, yeah. whereas Giuliani is dumb as a post. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, like to do. Uh, anyways, just oh man. Oh god. Oh man. Anyways, I, I'm I'm so oh. looking forward to it. So Taylor, uh, the tornado did not hit. For those who are, didn't realize, there was a tornado warning in in uh, Taylor's neck of the woods, and uh, we were worried yeah. he might have to leave, but he's still here. Yeah, and that's uh, you know, we've been sitting here. My wife's been like. I'm listening to the, I'm, I'm recording this podcast with headphones on she has to sit beside me in silence because the mic is on and every time she moves I'm like Cheryl <laughs> no. and she's like there's a tornado coming I'm like we'll know because the windows will break or something but until then <laughs> until then she's you're like, recording you <laughs> yeah uh, oh she won't let me upstairs to go get a beer so uh, we're just uh, recording this uh, underneath some, some stairs. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> oh, wow. It really, let me tell you, if you haven't experienced the market huddle, like uh, kind of nervous for your life, it's a, it's a really heightens it. It's real nice. <laughs> That's how Patrick and I'm, I do every yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, does anyone have anything else to say? Because I want to go watch some Borat. All right. Nice. Have fun, guys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. It was a, a fun show. Glad to be back. Oh, and yeah. uh, good to have you back, uh, partner. All right. I hope the well, new uh, liver settles in properly. Yeah, yeah I know. It's uh, the stitches <laughs> yeah. are healing really well. It's uh, it's all good. <laughs> you had to go to the all old right, country guys. to get a new liver. <laughs> 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 you had to kill someone for it. <laughs> yeah, maybe he uh, he lost out on one of these trades trying to earn some extra money. <laughs> How much does uh, one of these livers go for? <laughs> No one would want this. All right. Uh, okay, right. folks. On that note. Thanks for, right. <laughs> thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week. All right. Take care, Have everyone. See ya.